Does anybody know what digest really means? I mean, we know the digestive system, what it does, but what they really mean by that word? Breakdown. There you go, breakdown. Digest means to break down our foods or our nutrients, to break them down. And in lecture, when we get to this part in lecture, or you get to this part in lecture, you're going to learn you shred it with your teeth. That's a, the first real part of digestion. But we also have chemicals in our mouth that help to digest the food. The thing is, in the modern American world, we eat so fast. We don't give those chemicals much time, and we don't even chew it enough to give our teeth a chance to break it down. When that happens, the rest of your tract has to work harder to make up for it. The chemicals have to do the work that your teeth should have done, okay? Now, I'm not saying that's going to make you die young or anything like that. It's just not optimal for health. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go just basically through the organs. This first, I'm going to do this half, and then I'll raise it up, and we'll do the bottom half. I'm letting you know what the organs are, and maybe not much about them, but a little bit about them. So to start with, here's the mouth. And they're going to call this space here the oral cavity. Notice how tiny it looks. Don't worry, we'll see a better picture zoomed up of this. It looks so tiny because the mouth's closed and the tongue's in it. And when your mouth's closed, you know, you're sitting there right now with your mouth closed. You can feel where your tongue is. It takes up most of that space inside of your teeth or a good percentage of it. And then we get back here. And if food made it back here, it would now be in the throat. Remember the fancy word for throat? There it is, the pharynx right there now this picture is not as detailed as the other one and that's okay we don't need it to be i'm not going to ask you on this picture where's the exact border between between the oral cavity and the pharynx because it's blurred where does it become the esophagus that we don't need the exact locations on this i will say though this is a good picture for showing us as the throat goes down it becomes the esophagus so this does a better job than our other picture showing us that Okay, so back up to the mouth. What, what we really want to do in the mouth here is talk about the salivary glands. So there are three salivary glands. There's their name. The big one in your cheek right here makes most of the saliva. You can tell by its size. It's called the parotid gland. Parotid gland. By the way, back in the day, there was a disease that kids got called mumps, and people would swell up right here. You hardly ever see it anymore. It can happen, but you don't see it that much. Most people don't. Um, but that's the inflammation of the parotid gland where it swells way up. Then uh, there's a set of glands under the tongue called the sublingual. And then right on the corner of the jaw. So if the parotid's on the outside, up under here is the submandibular glands. So there are our three. They're sets. They're on both sides. Okay, even the sublingual, kind of like that on the tongue, okay? Uh, the neat thing that I like to mention about this to me is sometimes you can feel the saliva coming out of your mouth. The parotid gland has a duct, opens up on your top teeth right about here. If you're ever drinking really warm liquid or hot soup or something where your mouth is very warm and you put your tongue up there, if saliva is coming out because your mouth's so hot, the saliva will feel cold or feel cool and you can feel it coming out. So really, if you're drinking something like a hot lemon drink that's tangy, that makes you produce saliva, you can feel the saliva just pouring out by your tongue up there. Okay. If you want to get a picture with nothing written just because you want to have what's at the top there, you can. It's kind of up to you. I'm going to do it no, I'm not. I'm not going to take our pictures tonight because I got the pictures last time. So it'll go faster if I don't stop for me to take pictures. But if you want that, that's the top stuff. Okay. Didn't really add anything to it. As we move down, the esophagus joins the stomach. And notice how I said that. I said it joins the stomach. So I actually lied to you because the reality is this. When we're developing inside a mom, this tube that we're talking about now, it was all one tube. So when you first start your small intestine, large intestine, stomach, esophagus, mouth, it's all the same tube. 
And as you develop, it turns and bends and changes and becomes these organs we see. So very important philosophy or concept. The esophagus does not join the stomach. It continues on and it was the same thing and the stomach grew bigger so it looks different. So it's really one tube that we call different organs because they have changed and developed to have different functions. So what does that mean? Here's what that means. Your esophagus ain't gonna pull apart from your stomach. Why? Because it's one continuous tube. It's not like glued together. Okay. So then you get to your stomach and you can see it's nice and J-shaped. It's hidden where its beginning is, it's kind of hidden here. So we'll see another picture of the stomach later. But what we can see is back here. Do you guys see where it narrows down right there? Where that narrow band is, that's where it becomes the small intestine, right there. So sometimes on this picture, I come in and mark that up a little bit. Let's see if I can get this just to the right so I can have everything we need on that one picture. So I'll put the little, and I'll use the thin one, it's fine. The little tight band right there. It's where it goes from stomach to small intestine. And with the small intestine, there are actually three different regions or three different portions of the small intestine. The first one is called the duodenum or duodenum or duodenum. There's so many pronunciations for that. Kind of regionally, it depends where you're from as to how most people might say that. It, usually, I want you to see where it goes because it's hidden by other stuff, by the large intestine there. That's what it does behind the scenes. It's basically a C-shaped curve. And as soon as that C-shaped curve changes and goes another direction, it becomes part two of the small intestine, the jejunum. And usually we say that's this kind of upper band of it right here. It's not perfect, but it gives you the idea. And then as it twists and comes down here, we're going to change its name to the third part, the ilium. So the, the truth is by looking at the jejunum and the ilium from the outside, you only know which is which based on where they are. But if you were a histologist and you went in and cut them open, they have different characteristics. That's how they can tell if they do biopsies where it's from or do things like that because it looks different on the inside. Um, the layers look a bit different. Some of the tissues and some of the cells in there and other characteristics. Okay. And so that's the main tube. We went from the mouth down into the throat, which we called pharynx esophagus, stomach, and now the three parts of the small intestine. After that would be the large intestine. And I know it's hard to see here, so I want to assure you, right at the end, the last, the last two couple of slides we do, I put the large intestine up there by itself. I zoom up to make sure you can see all the features of the large intestine, all right? So here it will be hard, but I am gonna number them for you so you at least have heard the order and get the order once, and then we'll repeat it at the end of class to help kind of lock it in. And it'll be clearer because it'll be zoomed. So notice, here is where the small intestine ended. And what it does is it attaches right into the large intestine, right there. And so that first part, and this actually, to be honest, it's that part right there, that is where the small intestine leads right into the large intestine, right there. So let me make that blue. We'll go blue, there's blue there, and it opened right up into the large intestine. And we'll use black for the large intestine. This first part of the large intestine, boy, if it was me labeling it, I would have put the arrow right here. You know how I'm picky about that, but it's not how they do it. First part of the large intestine is called the cecum. It is a blind end pouch. That means 
here's what's crazy, y'all. The small intestine attaches on the side and the large intestine's a little pouch there. Stuff comes in and gets pushed up, moves up, right? So check this out. The second region, as it progresses upward here, and when I say it, I mean poo-poo, feces, right? The waste product that we're trying to get rid of. They call that part of the intestine the ascending colon because the material in it is moving up. So that's number two, ascending colon. Then it will turn the corner and go in front of the duodenum right here over to that side. Since it crosses, they call it the transverse colon. And that's way, it's kind of high on us, to be honest. Then it turns the corner and the material inside travels down. So they will call that the descending colon. Notice there's a lot of parts to the large intestine. Then it gets down here in the corner of this side and it takes a turn and it dips back up and then points down. So I like to say it makes an S curve like that. And so they call it sigmoid. Then as it straightens out, they call it the rectum. So I'm going to put the six over there just to kind of my numbers were getting too close. And the anal canal is not just where that's pointing. It's actually about that much of it. So I'll change the pointer. And so that is number seven. And then the anus is technically the opening where the material leaves. Okay. That little band that I discounted. I'll name that later. We're not ready to do that. yet. So that gives you all the parts of the small intestine and the large intestine. Keep in mind, as you digest food, you break down a lot of it, you absorb it into the blood, but the waste products remain in your intestinal tract and they get pushed through the small intestine. And then once it gets to the large intestine, I'll go ahead and tell you this, even though it's not lab and it's not on the lab test, the number one job of the large intestine is just to remove water. It just recaptures your water. So that, cause it's already, the body's already got all the nutrients out of it. So at that point, it's a waste product and a lot of water. Your large intestine sucks the water out of it. It gets drier and it just passes out of the body. Okay. That's not the only function of the large intestine, but it's a major, it's the number one. This is the appendix. Can you see where the appendix is coming out of? Can you kind of tell? It's coming out. I know I covered it. It's coming out of this. What was this called? Very good. Cecum. The cecum. The appendix is a lymphatic organ that comes out of the cecum. Okay. They, so it's not part of the colon. It's not part of the large intestine. It's lymphatic. It's immune. And they have found out that it does this. It's one of the major locations in your whole body that makes your good, healthy bacteria. You know, a long time ago, they used to say, we don't know what it's for. They even called it vestigial. That means it's old, ancient, doesn't really have a function. It's just kind of hanging out there. And modern research, you probably, if you're into nutrition or the human body, you might hear about the microbiome or flora or anything like that. Um, your body, you are carrying more bacterial cells in and on your body than you have human cells. More bacterial cells are on us and in us than we have human body cells. So these bacteria are so important. That means if your appendix gets removed, it's, it could change your bacterial composition in your body. And it could impact your health probably minorly compared to major things, right? Not major like a heart attack or stroke or anything. But maybe you'll have some digestive upset because it won't be right. Like sometimes people take antibiotics, wipes out the flora, and their guts get messed up. That could happen after the appendix but we typically don't notice that much. It's just something to consider. Okay, 
Next thing I got to do is I got to take this off the screen. So you may want to screen capture it. It is pretty messy, but don't worry. We're going to see it again. What we won't see again is the small intestine three areas like this. So this is the only picture we have those on. But the large intestine we'll see again. So I'm not ready to leave this yet because we have to talk about the other glands, the very important other glands. And so I can even go ahead and zoom in a little more for us to see those because of where they're located, kind of in the middle. Liver. You know what this is? Yeah, that green one is the gallbladder. So that's the liver and the gallbladder. Look, this little guy over here is the spleen. And who can remind me what this is? Very good. That's the pancreas. So maybe I'll zoom it down so you can see the words. Get it just to the right spot. And these are accessory organs. Some of them are glands, some of them. They do various things, but they are very important, very important to the way that your digestive system functions, except for the spleen. It's not digestive at all. They just have it there because it's in your abdomen. And so they wanted you to go, oh yeah, I can't forget the spleens here, okay? Hey, from the time you were little, when uh, people talk about eating food and digesting and the organs of the food type, organs in the body, What's the number one organ that people talk about for digestion? Stomach. stomach. Always. Don't go swimming after you eat. It, you know, stomach, 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 stomach. I think it's important for people that get through AMP going into healthcare to know the stomach is absolutely not the number one digestive organ. It's mind blowing. The stomach, this is crazy. The stomach can only digest one kind of nutrient. See, when we eat, we eat carbs and we eat fats and we eat proteins and we eat all these other things. The stomach, as far as they know right now, let me qualify that. They learn stuff. Something might change someday. But for these big macromolecules, only protein. That is all the stomach digests. Now, it does other things. It makes some chemicals that help you absorb vitamins like B12. Uh, it has acid to fight bacteria. But as far as its digestive, true digestive function, it only has an enzyme to break down protein. So let me help you to understand something about humans and how we've morphed into modern day society. Um, typical diet around here consists of mostly carbs. Mostly, 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 mostly carbs, okay? And there will be days, even people that like protein or like meat, it's just so easy not to eat it because carbs are everywhere. We don't have any organ in the body that just breaks down carbs. We don't have any organ in the body that only breaks down fat, see? Where, where you can break down those other things, you can also break down protein, typically. So, but this is, if we look at the body telling us a story about how it works, we have an organ that the only thing it breaks down is protein. That's telling us that protein is important. I'm not telling you you have to eat meat, but I'm telling you you have to find protein. Protein, your body structure, Half of every cell in your body is protein, and the other half is fat. There's, the cells are almost zero carbs. They're just like little receptors. So yes, we, need, we could use carbs for energy, but we don't need as much energy as the carbs we eat. So proteins feed your body for healing. Remember how growth hormone heals your body? When it repairs at night, it's using protein to repair. That's how. So getting protein. They say they're starting to realize this and starting to say things like, oh, Americans kind of don't eat enough protein. So I think as we move forward in the next few years, I know they're, they're trying to get all the artificial meats and things like that and trying to increase their protein count. 
right now those that they have they have too many fake chemicals in them maybe they'll get better over time my hope is they will but right now they're not and the other thing you should know about protein plant proteins your body can only use about one third to one fourth of that that you can use from an animal protein so let's say you ate a quarter pound burger if you ate a quarter pound of plant you would only be getting um like one twelfth of the pound of protein worth instead of a quarter pound so it's a big difference on usability and you don't hear people talk about that either so if you're doing pea protein or vegan proteins of some kind you need to get more because your body can't use it okay all right so that's just offside for your health but pretty important yes ma'am So, so most of the protein drinks have very cheap sources of protein, like whey. And whey is not a great source of protein. It's better than no protein, but it's not an optimal protein. Okay. Yeah, no. Right. It, yeah, yeah. No, I understand. And I used to drink those things too, but there's, so you can look for some other ones like, Look for some that maybe have collagen protein or bone broth protein or some other to mix in. I'm not saying getting ways bad, but if that's your major source of those kind of proteins, your body doesn't utilize that to the full extent either. Okay. Better than nothing, but not perfect. Okay. All right. What's the gallbladder do? Oh, it gets stuck and it hurts and it has to come out. What else does it do? So let me rephrase it. Uh, the liver has over 500 functions. Right now, we're only going to do one. It makes bile. Okay. And the reason I'm telling you that now is because bile is stored in the gallbladder. Okay. So we'll come back to that in a little bit, um, like in the second half of class today, we'll come back to that and talk about the relationship between the gallbladder and the liver. And also, can you guys see these tubes in the background here? They kind of disappear, right? The tubes right here go right there. And there's tubes through here that go right there and they go into that duodenum. So your liver and your gallbladder and your pancreas, they dump all their chemicals into the duodenum. Therefore, the duodenum makes a lot of enzymes on its own. And all these organs dump their enzymes in there. So your true number one digestive organ is right there, the duodenum. Yep. That is the number one digestive organ. It digest in when food is in it is when it is primarily digested. Okay, I'm gonna snag that one because I did it a little different order than normal. I might want to remember that. Okay, this next thing. Everybody got that? that almost. Oh, no, it's okay. That's okay. Always, if I move the slide too fast, y'all tell me because I'm not always paying attention to what y'all are doing. I should be. There's only a few of us. It would be easy enough. Okay. Oh, that's good. I got it right where I wanted it. Okay. No, I didn't. My bad. Let's go there. That's better. Okay. So this is not real, right? Obviously it's a drawing, but it's not even a real drawing. Remember how we said your gut was one tube at one point and then it starts to change? Well, just like, just like blood vessels, remember arteries and veins have layers. Unfortunately, we didn't do that lab together. That was our one night that we had apart. So you listened to that when we did blood vessels, but there's a tunica intima, a tunica media, and a tunica externa. It's got three layers. And whether it's an artery or vein, they may look a little different, but it still has the same layers and they're still the same tissue. 
The same is true for your gut. Whether we're in the small intestine, large intestine, or stomach, it has the same layers. They just represent different, okay? Esophagus, pretty much the same. Its outer layer would be a little different, but all the others would be the same. So the concept, this is what this is. This is a generalized cut of your gut somewhere. It's not a real. I can't say this is small intestine, large. I'm not going to say where it is because it's not real the way they've drawn it. It's here to show you the layers. So this is all about learning the layers that would be in any part of your gut tube. Okay. So we will start in the center. Right here with, aha, uh -huh. what do we call the hollow part of any tube? Very good. Call it a lumen, right? We call it a lumen. So there's the lumen. And you probably know from other things we've done that most of the time the lumen is lined by epithelium. And then outside of epithelium, we have connective tissue because there was a basement membrane and then the connective tissue. So what I want you to see here, epithelium, connective, and smooth muscle right there. Epithelium, connective, muscle. And collectively, those three layers right there are called the mucosa. Change that because I didn't mean to go over epithelium. And so this shows you then that it points to them and says one layer is epithelium, one layer is connective tissue, and the other is smooth muscle. But they actually gave that layer a name. And I go, I want you to go ahead and understand. Let me do this so you can see them there. I want you to understand what its name means. That little thin strip of red tissue, that smooth muscle, is the outer part of the mucosa. So they just gave it a name that means that, muscularis mucosa. It is the muscular layer of the mucosa. The reason they had to give it two names is because there's more muscle later, so there's another muscularis. And so it will have two names also. Okay. So here, let me recap. We're going to have four layers of your gut tube. The inner layer is called the mucosa, and it actually has three parts, epithelium, connective, and smooth muscle. Okay. Um, lamina propria I scratched out because in normal healthcare, we don't ever use that. That's like a lab term or somebody that's studying histology or pathology or something like that. Probably you'll get through your career without having to worry about what lamina propria is, I imagine. But boy, my histology professor loved it when I was in college. Outside of these three, boom, boom, boom. Then we get a thicker layer of connective tissue. They call that region. And notice, to me, it kind of looks a little like a spider web. That's the submucosa. So mucosa is one, submucosa is two. And you can tell looking at that, you see things that are red and blue. Take a while, guess what those are? Mm -hmm. Arteries and veins, blood vessels. You see things that are yellow, nerves. And what's a wild guess for green? Lymphatics, lymph. So there are blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatics running through the submucosa. Okay. There's also glands in there. Well, why? Why? Because the gut's alive. And everything in here needs to stay alive. It needs nutrients, blood flow. There's muscle. The nerves are going to go there to help the muscle to work. And they're producing some fluids the lymphatic needs to drain it. So it's just very logical. So that's the submucosa. Number one thing about the submucosa, thick layer of connective tissue. Next we have our two layers of muscle. 
One of the fibers, you can see the direction on these, they go like that. And this one, these go like that. So these would be called circular, this would be called longitudinal. So there are both circular fibers and longitudinal fibers. And collectively, both of those are called the muscularis externa because they're the outer layers of muscle, the outer two layers of muscle. Remember, you don't have which is inside or outside circular or longitudinal, because if you look at that picture, the circle looks like a circle. All right. Lastly, if we come to the very outside, I like to start over here usually and just put a little thing like that and say, oh, look at those little cells all the way around. That looks like how many layers of cells? It looks like one layer to me. Yeah, it looks like one layer. And they're trying to show you that they're flat. Aha, what do we know is one layer of flat cells? There you go. How many times we say simple squamous in AMP2? Lots of times, lots of times. So that membrane on the outside, its name is the serosa. That is the fourth layer, the outer layer. It is epithelium. We know it's simple squamous epithelium. And I just like to mention, there's a little connective tissue associated with it, but you're never going to be asked that, okay? Uh, it's more important for me to help you to understand that simple squamous right there. So that is the serosa. So why put a simple squamous membrane on the outside of your gut tube here? Oh, it's, it's not. It's tricky. Does your guts move? Do you move? Do you want them to build up friction? Remember how your lungs were? Your lungs are in here. We don't want them to build up friction. Last time we talked about the pleura. Pleura are simple squamous. This is like the pleura. This is that the pleura for the guts, except we don't call it pleura. In lecture, it might say peritoneum. This is the inner lining of the peritoneum or the visceral peritoneum. But when we're doing layers, they just call it the serosa. So it's just a membrane to hold it together and prevent friction. So when it moves around in the body, and not a lot, but a little, hopefully it doesn't get stuck. But when people get injuries, sometimes they get scar tissue between this and it can start to bind and stick to things. Even after surgery, surgery is an injury too. Sometimes people get scar tissue after surgeries. So that's, that's the bulk of this so far. So go ahead and get that the four layers, and notice I did focus on their tissue types, right? The layers and the tissue types. So once you guys get that, I'll take that off the screen because there's a couple other things I want to point out. The first thing is this. There's an, a new word that's not a new word. I think at some point we said superior mesenteric artery on a video. Um, this right here, this serosa, it actually leaves the organ and forms a membrane for the blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatics to travel through. And so this membrane would go through the abdominal cavity and it would protect those so they don't get twisted, so they don't get messed up. And so they said, oh, these membranes that leave the organ, we have to name them. We can't just call them a membrane. So they picked this name. Mesentery. So that's what a mesentery is. So at the end of the night, I'm going to show you a mesentery. Okay. We'll see one of them. This is a generic, but many places in the digestive area in the abdominal cavity will we have mesenteries. 
and they are these little simple squamous membranes that come together, one on each side, and hold blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatics. That's what they do. So now I can move this up. I'm going to leave the word mesentery there to remind you how important it is, but I'm going to move up to this part, and that is this. These little nerves, there's two separate groups of nerves. And it to me, it looks like one group. I'll just be honest with you. But I know that one of the groups stops at the muscle. It goes to the muscular layer and stops. And then the ones that continue on beyond that go into the submucosa. So being A and P, they say, oh, that's two groups. We got to name them. Let's name one for the muscle and one for the submucosa. So look at the name of these nerve bundles submucosal nerve plexus. In AMP1, maybe you learned this, maybe you didn't. That's why I'm here to fill in some of those little gaps. A plexus is when a nerve comes together and comes apart. We like to think of it like braiding, like you braid hair. That's like a braiding or a joining and a separating of nerve fibers. If nerve fibers do that, they call it a plexus. So to me, because they're yellow and you're in AMP2, I'll tell you, if you don't have to put the word nerve in there if you don't want to. If you just put submucosal plexus, I know that if you get that much, you know it's a nerve, okay? If you want to use the full name and put submucosal nerve plexus because it reminds you, you're welcome to. The other, and so let me highlight it for you. Here's the submucosal nerve plexus right here, all of these nerves in the connective tissue in the spider web. The ones that stopped in the muscle layer, well, they can't just call them muscle plexus, sorry. They had to do a fancy way. Remember, myo means muscle, and enteric is what they use for intestines. So myenteric plexus means intestinal muscle plexus. Both of those are nerve plexuses within the guts, so they're considered intrinsic. That's what that category above them is. I will just let you know, on the lab test, I never ask you to give me intrinsic nerve plexus as an answer. I will point to one of these and say, name it. Name this or name this. Name this yellow thing. Name this yellow thing. It's either that plexus or that plexus. So here's what that means. For some reason, and I just want to, maybe it's on a Quizlet, maybe it's on Study Blue, maybe it's somewhere, I don't know. A lot of people answer that question, intrinsic nerve plexus. So I think there may be some study material out there where somebody wrote that and people think that's, that's a partial credit answer. It's not totally wrong, but there's a better answer, right? If there's a question in lecture that says the myenteric and submucosal plexus are both considered what? then that would be intrinsic nerve plexuses, okay? So now this is the final picture. You can get this picture and we're done with picture two. Some of these pictures take a while to get through. I can't believe it. It is already seven o'clock almost. God. I promise to do my best Dr. Day impression and have you home by 1030. <laughs> you were never here that late, were you? Maybe like 9.15. 9.15? Oh, that's not so bad. Back in the day, I used to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sir! <laughs> okay, one of the ways we'll make up is by me telling you this picture was done in respiratory. Everything that was done in respiratory is what you need. So what that means is you don't need the arch. Okay. By the way, the one I cut off up there is soft palate. There's hard palate, there's uvula, tonsils, pharynx, epiglottis, hyoid, laryngeo, everything on here. So everything that you can see you need, go ahead and take a picture. The explanation is in respiratory. It didn't change. It's still the parts. There's still the parts. I might remind you, though, as you're getting the picture, Remember, the back of your throat, the pharynx, has how many regions? Three. 
What's the top region behind? What's it behind? It's called nasal. So what's it behind? Notice I didn't ask for its name. What's it? It's behind the nose. So it's called nasopharynx. The middle region is behind the mouth. No, behind the mouth, oro for oral cavity. Okay. The third region is behind the voice box. So laryngeo. So just to help you lock in, because those are the hard words from that lab last time. It's behind the nose, nasopharynx. Behind the mouth, oro. Oro like mouth, not gold. Okay. And then laryngeo. Laryngeo. Oh. This next picture, did anybody need to take a picture of that? Y'all got it? This next picture then is really good and we haven't seen anything like this in respiratory. And this shows us a lot. It's got a lot on there. Um, one thing I will mention anywhere, this is I made a decision a while ago, anywhere it names the arches, that's a little more detail than we need. So I just take them out, okay? So easy stuff, upper lip, lower lip. I think you know that probably won't even be on the test. Sorry, it would be nice if it was, okay. Next thing, teeth, they're not even labeled, so that's not on the test. Well, actually it might be, because on the next slide, we're gonna learn to name all the teeth. So I could have you name it on this picture and not just use that, just so you know. Um, let's get to the easy stuff. This is way better than the other picture. The uvula right in the middle hanging down. Okay. Also, soft palate. This does a better job of showing us the soft palate going across there. Now, the soft palate has these things called arches. We're not doing that. So if you're asking anything across here, it's just soft palate. Hard palate is up higher. We don't really see where it changes. You can't see exactly. You could palpate it feel of it but you can't see it they try to show you ridges but you can't tell where but the new thing is right down the middle you know you had two halves they came together and made a seam anytime in the body that happens they call it a raphe r-a-p-h-e so that's like a seam where midline you were sutured up just naturally not artificially so that's the palatine raphe because it's in the hard palate and even extends to the soft palate now, next, the word for gums, gingiva. That's why inflammation or gum disease is called gingivitis. The tongue, when I look at this tongue and I see all that, I think of Shamu. I don't know what it makes you think of. It looks weird, right? But something neat. These are the openings for the sublingual ducts are on the side. And the two right in the middle, those are the openings of the submandibular ducts. So even though submandibular ducts were further back and on the side, they have a really direct tube with one little opening on each side. So that is the gland. I know it's happened to you. You ever been eating and you've seen it shoot right out of your mouth? Your saliva go, what do they call that? Gleek, G-L-E-E-K, gleeking. Any of you gleek pros? You, Sean, you gleek at will? No. <laughs> Have you ever seen it happen when somebody's eating and just a stream of saliva comes shooting out? Sometimes it happens. <laughs> Sometimes it happens on accident. Usually it's when you would not want it to happen and it goes flying. Some people especially junior high boys, can be really good at doing it. I never could do it. But my wife and her sister, they had an amazing talent. They discovered when they were like 12 years old, they could gleek at each other. If my wife, I'm not recording, I promise. I really am. She knows I talk about this. From here, she could hit y'all. She can go. 
<laughs> all she has to do is get a lemon and look at it. And it's like, here I go. <laughs> it's crazy. It just shoots out. So I lose that battle every time. All right. <laughs> these are teeth. What are these? I know we want to say gums. Oh, that pointer's so little. I only know because I was controlling it. Gingiva. Look here. You see that cord? And that cord? There's a cord that holds your lip down to your gums, just like horses have those, right? You've probably seen it on a horse before. But here's the thing about those. They don't, kind of like the guts, they don't just glue onto the outside. It goes deep within. And so if you or someone you know has a gap between your teeth, there's the reason right there most of the time. It's just a thicker band of tissue and it pushes the root and your teeth are separated. And so these things, these cords are called a frenulum. So the top one is on the upper lip. So they call it superior labial frenulum. The bottom one's on the lower lip, inferior labial frenulum, okay? Notice I'm not marking most stuff up because we're doing everything on here. That's why I'm not taking the time to mark everything. Here's our cool little normal tonsils, palatine tonsils, the ones that you say ah and you see. Now you can kind of see their position. This is to me a better picture than the other for that too. Um, ah, this one. This is our second vestibule. So it's easier to show you in person if you guys are listening. It's between your cheek and your gums or between your teeth and your cheeks. There, uh -huh. That is called your oral vestibule all the way around there, okay? So we have nasal vestibule and oral vestibule. Remember, a vestibule is always a space. The nasal vestibule is where your fingers go when you're a little kid. <laughs> ah, and we also have, obviously, the tongue. We have a cord under the tongue. So that is a frenulum, and tongue is lingual, so it's the lingual frenulum. Sometimes that grows all the way to the tip of your tongue, and if, it, if they leave it there, then you, when you learn to talk, you would have an impediment. So some people, like my brother, look, I get my wife and my brother in this one. He was born with that. So they snip it right there. And that's that. No speech impediment. They got to get it early before they start talking, though. Or before even really earlier than that, if you even waited super, they would just not use their mouth the same way and would have to learn, relearn it. Last thing. When you say ah, the back of the throat that you're seeing, that's oropharynx. So that's the back wall of the oropharynx. Just that's good orientation. So there's your picture for this. It's a really good picture, actually. So I want it to be clear on your phones. Here come the teeth. Good news about the teeth, all you need to do is learn a name. You don't need to learn what year they grow, and we don't need baby teeth. Because if you work in a PD clinic, you'll learn when the teeth come in, right? Right now, it'd be just memorization for no purpose. If you go into dental hygiene, you'll learn when they come in, because you'll be working with that, and it's more relevant to you. All right, the naming, though, is pretty important. The first two, well, let me start this by saying we divided it right here. These eight and these eight have the same name. The same teeth on the opposite side. And your bottom jaw and upper jaw, same eight on the top on each side. So if you have all your teeth, you would have 32, eight, 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 and eight. Okay. You might have some removed, might have some never come in, what, what have you. But we're going to learn the name of eight. And it really helps you name 32. So here they go. The first two are called the incisors. The front one is central. And this is 
lateral. So central and lateral incisor. The, it's your front teeth and the ones beside them, okay? Beside that, commonly more pointy. That's why they call them canines. So I don't think that's a good drawing of a canine. Doesn't look that pointy. I mean, if they're going to call it canine, they could at least, anyway. Old folks, even older than me, like my grandparents and my dad, they always called these eye teeth. When my dad talked about them, he would say my eye teeth. And to me, they were always canines. But anyway, so that's just how generations change things, okay? don't You don't need to know that. I'm just mentioning it. Um, the next two. So after the canines, we have two premolars, first and second, or you could call them the two bicuspids, first and second bicuspid. Premolars just fine. You don't have to be fancy. And then the last three are the molars, first, second, and third molar. And you should know, which we all do, what is the third molar called? The wisdom tooth. Okay. And so those are the names. And we're done with that if you want the picture. Next, we'll learn the parts of a tooth. Start at the top. There is a typo on here from the publisher. And it's the bottom one right there. It's wrong. So I'll get to it in a minute. So I'll hide it for now. OK, the white part of your tooth, if it's still white, not yellow or gray or some of the color, that is enamel. Even if it's changed color, it's still enamel. You know, in the modern world, they can do all kinds of things to brighten that. They can get it so bright that it's brighter than bright and blinds you, okay? But that is enamel. Underneath it, the material that they're showing in blue here that makes up most of the tooth, that is dentin. That is why most of the tooth is made of dentin. They call the person that works on your teeth a dentist. How cool is that? Do not worry about the tubules. I will not ask that, okay? Those little lines, we're not going to worry about that. Now, in the center, then, there is a cavity that's kind of swollen. So they call it a pulp cavity. Just contains some material. The material it contains is basically blood vessels and nerves. Uh, no lymphatics here, by the way. Wow. OK, so it's blood vessels and nerves. Over here, we see the gums. I'm not going to ask you about the sulcus. Okay, I'm not going to ask that. So I'll go ahead and do this for you so you can get your picture. And notice, I didn't mention it yet, but now I will. The part of the tooth that sticks out is called the crown. The part that's first embedded in the gums is the neck. And the bottom part that goes way into the bone is the root. So here's your picture of the top part, and then I'll zoom down and show you all the bottom stuff. Okay. so cool today part of the thing we did it with the chambers we went to milam you all know what milam is cool. it's the performing arts elementary school and we uh each of us went to a different classroom and read the teacher the classroom i went to was one of my former students it was just random and that's happened more than once it's always so cool she teaches third grade now she thought she was going to be a nurse and now she just loves teaching third grade so it's cool so here's our root. What's this? Very good. It's dentin even here. Look at this. This was a pulp cavity. Look what it becomes as it narrows down. You ever heard of a root canal? 
They call it surgery. If you go have dental surgery, they call it a root canal, right? See, everyone has a root canal. So when they say you had a root canal, they mean they need to go through that part of the eye, eye too. Yeah, okay, that's what they mean. Down here's the bone. You might remember this, if this is the apex and that's a hole, a hole in bone is called a foramen. So it's an apical foramen. And now the two very important things here and here. First, here's the root canal. Here's the dentin. Outside is bone and this ligament. Since that ligament surrounds the tooth, periodontal. Odont means tooth. Okay, so periodontal surrounding the tooth. So what that leaves, which I don't know how a publisher missed this. They had 50 AMP professors across the nation review it. That little brown tissue there between those two, between the ligaments and the dentin is not called cement, but it's close. It's cementum. It's called cementum. And so now you can get, that's everything we need on there. You know, the odds are you'll get one or two questions about a tooth. Out of everything we do. Probably one. Maybe two. Probably one. I mean, if you think about this, you have 25 questions. 12 of them are going to be from one chapter and 13 of them from the other, right? So, but it, once again, it's still randomized, which is crazy, I know, I know. I do kind of sometimes miss when I could pick every question that you guys would see. All right, what we haven't talked about yet is sphincters. Anybody know what a sphincter is? Yep, it's a round muscle. That means it goes around a tooth or an opening. And it can either close it or open it. The first sphincter they're showing us is not the first sphincter, but it's the first one I'll talk about. Right at the back of your throat, about where the pharynx and the esophagus join, and we don't have a perfect border for it, there's a little tightening that closes that, okay? And when we swallow, it opens up and lets stuff pass through, and then it closes back down. And so they call that area, that tight band right there, the upper esophageal sphincter because it's at the top of the esophagus. Okay. What do you think they're going to call the one at the bottom of the esophagus? Lower. Yeah, that's a great name, right? So just keep that in mind. Then I'm going to go fill in the blanks So what we didn't cover yet. In AMP1. That's not a mustache. <laughs> you learned that there was a muscle, a round muscle in the lips, in the tissue above the lips. Anybody remember the fancy name for that? Oh, did I hear y'all say it? Orbicularis oris. That is your first sphincter, okay? It is, can you control that muscle? Well, duh, <laughs> right? Every time we eat, we control it. We don't think about it in this way, but if you lost control of that, like I, I may have mentioned to you guys, I have a friend that had a problem with his thymus. It's auto autoimmunity, myasthenia gravis. He had a hard time speaking out of the blue last year in February. Just can't talk anymore, right? It feels like he gets gravel in there and then gets so tired he can't talk. Well, the next thing that happened is he couldn't close his mouth sometimes. So he would be eating. You've eaten all your life. You don't think about it. Food starts falling out of his mouth. It's like, what the heck? Just so things that we don't even, we subconsciously use these muscles all the time to close and chew and get food in just the right spot. We don't even think about it. Not just our lip muscles, but our cheek muscles too. Okay. 
All right. It is, if we can control it, what kind of muscle does it have to be? Yes. Skeletal muscle. It's skeletal muscle. I never ask what the upper esophageal is, but by the way, it's skeletal. Okay. But I, I absolutely wouldn't ask you that. Food, when you chew it up, you know, we still call it food, call it pizza, call it whatever. But when you swallow it, they change the name and they call the material that you swallow a bolus, a bolus. And that's what I wanted to show you on this picture. Oh, by the way, I will say this is a really good picture of your meatuses. It's better than the other. And that's when Dr. Day said turbinate, that's more of that view, but that's a concha. It's one of the concha and that's, so it shows better. Oh, those are actual canals in there and the air can swirl around it. So that's a better picture than the other one, but they have it. That's that. Okay. So you have to get it if you want it. To the next one. How far? Oh, we're, we're ways. So then here is the esophagus passing down to the stomach. And what I like to show you here is while we had the upper esophageal, there's a little round muscle right here. That what would be a great name for? Because it's already spelled here. That is a great name for it. That is a very common name for it. Unfortunately, this is one of those structures that has three names that depending upon where you work, they might like one term better than the other. And the real issue I have is this is probably the third most common name, and it's the one they put in the book. The most common is this. Cardiac what? Right. Sphincter. S-P-H. So on the test, I'll ask you to name it. Pick whatever name you like. Gastroesophageal is a good name because heartburn, now they're calling it gastroesophageal reflux disease. Gastro means stomach. So that's where the stomach and the esophagus are joined together there. And when that muscle doesn't work right, acid can go up and creates burning. So they call that GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease or heartburn. It's really just so you know, and I've heard it here, it's really not an acid problem as much as it is a sphincter problem. When the sphincter doesn't work right, and on the other end of that, they're saying most people's sphincters don't work right, actually, when they have low acid. So you can have very low acid, but if the sphincter opens up, what little acid you have pours up in there. Or you can have low acid regularly, your sphincter opens, and all of a sudden your stomach decides to just make a bunch of acid for some crazy reason. And now all the acid's popping up there because your sphincter's too relaxed. They do not understand that well to this day, and they're not really great at treating it. There's a, there's a surgery where they go in and take your stomach and they twist it around that, the, the top part of the stomach, they wrap it around there and suture it to try to create an artificial sphincter. Sometimes it works for some people, sometimes it doesn't work very well at all. So heartburn's a crazy, difficult, weird thing to figure out. Um, there's the bolus coming down. Notice longitudinal muscles and circular muscles. They're just telling you they work together to push the food. The other word I want you to have up here is this, peristalsis. That is a wave-like contraction. A wave-like contraction. And it pushes the food to different location. 
So down the esophagus, out of the stomach, to the next area. Sometimes there's contractions that just mix and keep it in one location, but if it's a wave that pushes it through, then it's called peristalsis. Okay, so that's, that's this part. So you can snag that. I'll add something better. Why do we have a sphincter in the first place? Or molt, not just one. We can say to compartmentalize or to create multiple compartments. See, what the esophagus does is different than the stomach. And we all know the stomach has acid. If there was no sphincter at the top of the stomach, your acid could always go into the esophagus and seriously damage it. Okay, so we have to create two different compartments, an esophagus and a stomach. Well, what if we had no sphincter here? Then the acid could just pour into the duodenum. Body's too smart for that. Guess what it puts right there? A little sphincter. This sphincter, and I'll go ahead and tell you because we'll see it really soon anyway. It's named after the bottom part of the stomach. The bottom part of the stomach is the pyloric region. We'll do that in the next slide, so you'll see it on there. So they call that sphincter in the pyloric region the pyloric sphincter. And so um, just so happens that the duo here, I'll write duo, is actually basic. Its pH is around nine. So your stomach pH is around two and your duodenum is around nine and they're right there together. They're one inch apart. It's that sphincter that regulates that. If it opened up, the acid would pour in there and it might not be so good for the duodenum. So Creating compartments and separating these organs by having tight sphincters can be very important. But they shouldn't be so tight they shouldn't open when you need them to, right? Imagine you eat some really bad food and you need to throw it up, and you can't. That could be bad. You'd stay sicker longer. Okay, now you can recapture that. Good, baby. If you want the rest of it, since I added to it. Our next picture is going to be the stomach on its own without so much of the esophagus, and it's going to have a lot more detail. Yeah, it's kind of weird, huh? There. <clears throat> so the esophagus comes in. The first thing we're going to do so we're going to learn that the stomach has these main regions, these areas that we will call regions. The first region is basically right here where the cardiac sphincter is. And so they call this region the cardia because it's by the heart. And they call it the cardiac sphincter because it's by the heart. Okay, so your heart's really close to that, so they call it the cardia. Um, you don't have to call it cardia. If you're asked what region it is, you can say cardiac region. That's just different wording. You can do it either way, cardia or cardiac region. Do you guys remember what this region and this sphincter were? Pyloric, there you go, pyloric sphincter. I'm not going to do canal or antrum, just pyloric region. We already know, oh, I'll, I'm just going to do regions. I'm not going to get ahead of myself, okay? This picture is one of those pictures that is so easy, but so hard if it's not explained. 
because where the pointers go, there could be a ton of answers for some of these. It's all about the question and the context. So somebody could be looking here, and I'll give you an example in a second. They can, they can look at that pointer lumen. You're only going to know that's lumen if I say name the space here. If I point at that, this is actually pointing at that little fold. That fold has a name. It's called Ruge. So the only way that you know is because you know the question and know what they're pointing at. Okay, now those Ruge, we're going to talk about in a second. So let me keep going with the regions now. See this part of the stomach that domes up right here? That part of the stomach is almost always holding air. It's supposed to. And it's a dome. And they call organs that have a dome, they call that part of the organ the fundus. So we will actually see that on a uterus when we learn the uterus. We'll see that the uterus has a fundus as well. And so the rest of it would be a good generic name for the main part of the stomach. The body. So there's our four. The stomach has four major regions. The cardiac region, the fundus, the body, and the pyloric region. So what I'll do is I'll let you get a screen cap of that and then I'll erase it and I'll mark up the rest of what I want you to have on. Can you remind me what's his space? Yeah, so that space is a lumen. This line, all, all, no matter where. That fold, that fold, bless you. That fold, that fold, all the folds are rugae. You do not need to tell me rugae of mucosa. In fact, I don't want to see that because I will just ask you for the name of the fold. Um, I don't want you to purely memorize pictures. I want you to understand folds or rugae. Only in the stomach. Folds, sorry, not only in the stomach, but these folds in the stomach are called rugae. There are other rugae in the body, but not that we'll cover tonight, not in this chapter. Easy, easy here. This curve's big, this curve's little. Lesser, greater, curvature. But even easy stuff, you still have to remember that's a big curve, but what word did they use for it, right? They used greater curvature, lesser curvature. Oh, this, well, this is kind of pointing at the bottom of the fundus. It's also almost pointing to that muscle, but really they're pointing to that membrane and they're telling you, oh, hey, don't remember. All parts of the guts have a serosa, a simple squamous right around the outside. Then I already did this, pyloric sphincter. I'm not going to do those. We know this is the duodenum. Up here, don't be confused. This is not part of the stomach. That's the esophagus. And this is a cool thing. The stomach is the only part of your digestive tract that has an extra layer of muscle. It has circular it has longitudinal i know if you're looking here at the stomach it's hard to see which is which and see the difference and that's okay i won't be asking you to name these from this picture which layer it is but it what i want you to know is it has a third layer an extra layer of muscle that goes look it goes at an opposite angle to those two why is that needed why is a third layer needed because the stomach is a big pouch and it has to churn and twist 
to mix the food. Okay. If it just had longitudinal and circular and it's a big pouch, it's going to, but it needs to squeeze and churn and mix the food. So the body grew a third layer to have that function. By the way, you know how long food usually stays in your stomach? Two to four hours, typical. Typical meal stays in the stomach for two to four hours because it, before it goes to the duodenum. Oh, and what, <clears throat> what are rugae? What word do we like to associate with them? Folds. Yes, they are folds of that lining, folds of that membrane, right? In the stomach. Because we're going to have folds of the small intestine, they're going to have a different name. There's a liver, there's a gallbladder, there's a pancreas, okay, leave it right there. Do you remember what the liver makes? Nice. Where is that bile stored? Very good. In the gallbladder. Okay. And what organ? Is that? Yeah, duo. Right. Duodenum. Good. And notice right here. Aha! Once it turns. Now the jejunum. Now the jejunum. So what we're going to do with this picture mostly is we're learning the relationship between the pancreas and duodenum and those tubes that go up to the liver and gallbladder. That's what we're doing here. And so first off, I'm going to show you that the pancreas, and by the way, we'll look at the pancreas in a minute on a slide because we did it before. There's a major duct in the pancreas. So a great name for the important one, the big one, is main pancreatic duct. There it is, right there. Yes, it has a little tiny sphincter there. I won't be asking you to name that one. Okay. Also, there's a little accessory one right there. Most people have that too. So there's two pathways for the pancreatic chemicals to get into the duodenum to work. The main and the accessory. Notice it's labeled right here. And those are just ducts. You may remember they carry digestive enzymes. We'll talk about that on the next slide. From the liver, though, <clears throat> what color are the tubes coming out of the liver? And why would you say they're coloring them green? Good try, but bile's also green. So in AMP, we've always used green for lymphatic until now. It's also bile is green, okay? So that one that I just drew in white right there, that one is called the bile duct. because it's carrying bile into the duodenum. It's carrying bile, so it's the bile duct. Now, these tubes get named like blood vessels. When they split, they're gonna rename it. So here's what I'm gonna do. We're gonna split it right here and right here. The part that goes straight up into the liver, they call it liver hepatic, they say it's kind of like blood vessels, so we're going to call it common. It's called a common hepatic duct. 
remember these are not blood vessels. I'm using that like how we named them, but these are ducts. They're not blood vessels. So the bile duct comes up and it becomes the common hepatic duct. And then the side that goes, the side that goes to the gallbladder, they call cystic duct. It's labeled here, cystic duct. And I wrote cyst there to help you understand why. A cyst is simply a fluid filled sac. So the gallbladder is a sac, it's full of fluid. They can use cyst when they're coming up with fancy names for it. So they said, oh, the duct that goes to the gallbladder, let's call it the cystic duct because it's going to a big old cyst. So there you go. Well, it stops there. So that duct, we got bile duct to cystic duct done. So if you have gallstones, they get spit out the cystic duct, they could get stopped. They can block it or they can go further and block the bile duct and block up into the liver. Okay. <clears throat> they could go all the way down here and get blocked too. They could go to lots of places and get stuck. The tube splits in the liver. It was common hepatic. So they just simply say, oh, those are the left and right hepatic ducts. Left and right hepatic ducts. Um, bile does something very important. So all nutrients <clears throat> need to get digested or broken down to be absorbed into the blood. The whole reason we eat is to give our body energy. We get energy when the nutrients go into the blood and spread through the whole body, just like hormones, and they leave the blood and go to the cells and feed the cells. That's the same thing that our respiratory system does with oxygen. That's what our digestive tract does with food. That's what our endocrine system does with hormones gets them in the blood to spread to the body to make the body work or to feed the body, whatever. Well, we're so used to even digestive, even on night one, digests, it digests, it breaks down, it digests. But bile, bile has a completely different function. Fat and oil, let me say it this way. If I took olive oil and canola oil and safflower oil, and some other oils and put them here, they could mix together because oils can blend or mix. It's called fat soluble. The thing is, is when you eat fats, they can stick together in your digestive tract and make a, like a pool of fat. It's all together. If your enzymes are trying to digest that, it's going to take forever because they can only get to the outside. So the body's so smart. It made a fluid that hits that pool of fat and busts it into millions of droplets. That's what emulsify means. Emulsify means, are you ready? Separates into droplets. Separates into droplets. And I will say this for you up here. Very tiny droplets very tiny droplets. Okay. Two more things looks like right here, actually a third. See how it looks like there's little ridges there, right? The stomach had rugae folds. These folds look different. Don't they look nice and perfect almost like you could touch them and they go. T -t 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 Sorry, that's their name. Plique circularis. <clears throat> On the next slide, you'll see a different name for them, and I'm okay with using that name too. It's a lot easier. Where these ducts come together, notice the bile duct and the main pancreatic duct join and they plug in here, 
and it actually divots in there. It creates like a little button that sticks out. Hey, remember when we did the heart, we had papillary muscles, they project out. Any projection could be called a papilla. Look what they call that, major duodenal papilla. I don't think I will be asking you to identify that, but I just like to point out a papilla is always a projection. And we have multiple ones of those that we study through AMP. What I do definitely, definitely want you to know is my favorite sphincter in the whole body is right here. Now, this is not one of those major sphincters. This is not guarding the duodenum, the whole, all the way around the duodenum. This is not the sphincter that was here, the pyloric sphincter like that. This is a little tiny sphincter on a duct, okay? So it's a different class of sphincter. It's a duct sphincter. It's little. It doesn't go with the others in our brain. But my goodness, it's got the coolest little name. Oh, it's a cool name. I want to use a cool thickness so it doesn't look like chicken scratch. Sphincter of Odie. That is the name of that little sphincter. Guess who it's named after? Yeah, Odie. And I don't know if you remember Garfield, the cartoon, but the little dog that gave Garfield fits was named Odie. So that's the sphincter of Odie right there. Now, 